Can you tell me your name and major? I am Victor Akiza, and I'm a political science major with a minor in philosophy. You just finished your capstone, correct? Yes, I did last. I did it last semester. Okay, and what was your capstone about? Uh, for my capstone, um, I'll give a little background to who I am. I was born in Mexico. I immigrated here when I was four years old. Um, I guess people say that it was uh, unauthorized, illegal immigration the way I came here. For my capstone, I, I really wanted to look further deeper into the root causes of immigration, especially for Mexico. Um, because every time I ask my parents or other people like why people leave Mexico, they say because of economic um, mishaps, because of poverty. And while that is very true, I think that wasn't really given the uh, full answer. I feel like there's a whole power dynamic behind those causes. And I just went to further, uh, further research those causes in my capstone. So what did you set out to learn? I don't think migration happens in a vacuum. Every time someone migrates from Mexico, there's uh, someone benefiting financially um, in New Mexico or the United States. So I went to see who was benefiting from migration um, financially because of the political economy of Mexico and what was happening to it through policies enforced by the United States. Uh, this whole ideology known as neoliberalism, which I didn't really understand before I started researching this. And it's still a complicated issue, but I feel like have a more profound understanding of neoliberal policies, especially about NAFTA, the North, um, North American Free Trade Agreement in 1994. And I just wanted to see how that affected working class Mexicans. So can you describe neoliberalism for someone who doesn't know? It's a broad ideology, but I would say neoliberalism is a political and economic ideology that has been used to describe how globalization pushed free market capitalist policies to every corner of the earth, privatization of industries, the the unregulation of the markets. Um, basically, it started, it really expanded after the, the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, because there was no prominent ideology to combat it. So capitalists and other um, um, ruling class politicians in capitalist countries really didn't have a challenge to stop them. So they could just go into developing nations, you know, completely privatize it. Well, no, not completely, but you know, more, um, uh, heavy privatization of the industries, and that really did affect the working class people. It did not really benefit them as the way they made it sound out to be. So can you give us a, a brief history of Mexico's transition to neoliberalism as a kind of political and economic paradigm? Yeah, for my paper, I had to also research like the history of Mexico, which is really interesting. Um, obviously, it was a Spanish colony until early 1800s, and it gained its independence. But like most Latin American countries, after getting independence from Spain, those class differences didn't really change. You know, there's still the ruling class, the, the uh, landowners, the rich comp compradors, they own most of the territory. And then that's how it was until the Mexican Revolution, which is really a really interesting period of 1910 and 1920. A part of it was the peasantry who wanted to, you know, they worked the land and they wanted to own the land. So some really important land reforms came about because of the Mexican Revolution. Um, and throughout for most of history, the 20th, 20th century, Mexico had a, a mixed public and private economy. Um, and that really started to deteriorate in the 80s. That's when neoliberalism was introduced, um, with some, especially with President Carlos Salinas in the 90s. He was the one that uh, helped draft NAFTA into law. So that's kind of how neoliberalism came about. Um, in the 1930s, there was a Mexican president named Lazardo Cárdenas, and he's known to be like, probably the most uh, famous Mexican president, most popular president. And he nationalized most of the industries, the oil, the copper, um, the lithium, most of the industries. And basically with neoliberalism, those industries that were once owned by the Mexican state, now were owned by American companies. Why did Mexico move toward neoliberalism? There was a lot, one of the main reasons was because there was a lot of corruption with the state-owned companies. The economy in Mexico in the 50s and 60s wasn't that bad, it actually kind of grew. And then the 70s and 80s it started kind of declining. Um, there's many reasons to this. And one and the United States took advantage of this decline. So that's where now a lot of neoliberals went into Mexico uh, who studied in the United States, especially uh University of Chicago. So I came into Mexico saying that, oh, we're gonna bring Mexico to the first world. You know, Mexico's not gonna be a third world country. And that's what kind of like sold uh, these neoliberal policies. So can you talk a little bit about the impacts of NAFTA and these neoliberal policies that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> like I said, before NAFTA, um, much of the Mexican 
industries were nationalized. Um, but with NAFTA, it opened up almost 90% of the economy to private investment. So that meant that all these industries in Mexico, from whatever the energy, the oil, all these industries were not were able to be bought off by American companies. And so now you have an American CEO in Wall Street or wherever owning the energy sectors of Chiapas, which is one of the poorest places in Mexico. And what do they know about the people who live there? They don't really care about the people who live there. They're only in, there, they're only in Mexico there for making a profit. So this is where like, well, yes, it might bring investment, might bring in more production. That doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna improve the lives of people. And many of these cases, um, jobs were created in, in Northern Mexico because of the industries that were like opened up by American companies, but the pay they were receiving was not enough to live on. So yes, yeah, some jobs were opened up, but they weren't actually like good living wage jobs. Um, and this created inflation and other sort of um, factors. But one of the biggest factors of NAFTA was in the agricultural sector. After the Mexican Revolution, this system named the um, ejidos, which is basically like the peasantry, the, the indigenous, mostly indigenous people who live in the rural parts of Mexico were able to like own their lands. So it was like land reform. And with NAFTA, all that was privatized. So this is like what really sparked such a, a mass migration because of all these farmers who literally could not work anymore. So not everyone left, right? Mm -hmm. And there was some resistance and you write about this in your, in your capstone. So can you tell us a little bit about that resistance? There's this group called the Zapatistas in Chiapas, Mexico. This group started off in the mid eighties with some guerrillas, um, who were Marxist Leninist in a sense, they were inspired by the revolutions in, in Central America and Cuba. Um, so they left to Chiapas um, and folks are starting like a social revolution. But when they got there, they realized that this class analysis that they had in mind didn't really intrigue the indigenous people there. You know, they, they were like, we're not the proletariat, we're just indigenous like people living here. We've been exploited by the Mexican state. So they kind of switched tactics and like, adapt to the, to the situation in Chiapas. And that's how they build up so much like um, support with the people there. And with the passing of NAFTA, they actually declared war on the Mexican government in 1994 on the January 1st. And they took over a couple of towns for a couple of days, for 12 days, I think, I'm not exactly sure. Basically, they believed that neoliberalism was a death sentence to them. And in many cases it was, um, because obviously Carlos Salinas, the Mexican president at the time, he used NAFTA as an excuse to propel Mexico to advance it to the first world while kind of leaving behind so many other people. So while the ruling class, the rich already were becoming richer, the middle class, like the upper middle class sort of grew, all these, the working class of peasantry were kind of forgotten about. And that's really what sparked the Zapatista um, uprising. So, and they demanded just that indigenous people have a seat at the table. So what were their methods? They were, I don't want to say violent, but they did use on arms, they had guns. Um, they really did not target any innocent people. They didn't, they didn't shoot, shoot any soldiers unless they were shot at. Um, the, lead, the spokesman for the Zapatistas at the time, Subcomandante Marcos, was very, very intentional about this. He critiques a lot of other um, social revolutions who might have used unnecessary violence, and he really was against that. But the government didn't really care about that. They were the ones that we use the most violence against them, you know, that portray them as terrorists in Mexico. But that didn't really work out because um, during these like 1994 and 95, there were mass up, like, protests all over Mexico with supporting the Zapatistas, you know, even today. So that there was massive support for them uh, because everyone kind of understood. If you look at the material conditions that existed in Chiapas, they were abysmal. You know, they're the poorest people in Mexico. And then how can you try to bring Mexico into the first world without addressing the root causes of like I'm the poverty that still remain and neoliberalism didn't seem to address that because they didn't really care about the poor people in a sense. Were they successful? It's interesting because I would argue that when they first uh, um, they first took arms and declared war on the Mexican government their plan was to spark like other like people would join in in Mexico you know and overthrow the Carolino Sali the free party. So they quickly realized that that wasn't really reasonable at the moment so they kind of adapted to their situations and now they control certain parts of Chiapas. I would say they're successful in that sense that they're able to provide a better life for the people there, even though it, you know, it didn't spark this massive revolution in Mexico. Um, but the, the territory, territory they do control has seen vast improvements because of Zapatistas and how they 
dictate their way of living. Can you do you see any impacts uh, today in Mexico's politics as a result of the Zapatista movement? Yeah, I think um, I think they gave voice to a lot of people who have been who were very angry with the pre party that had ruled in Mexico. Um, but unfortunately, the, in 2000, Vicente Fox, who was part of the even more conservative party, he won presidency. So it's interesting to see that even though you had this very left wing group who had so much popularity six years later after they, re they revolted, a more conservative president um, became, they was elected. Uh, but now you have uh, AMLO, the, which is, I wouldn't call him a leftist, but he is certainly more left leaning than other Mexican presidents. And he actually just yesterday or a couple of days ago had a really interesting speech in Mexico City, how he's declaring that Mexico is very is sovereign from the United States and he does not allow the United States to bully Mexico. So there is that progressive wave that's happening now and he is one of the most uh, popular presidents in Mexico. So it's interesting to see how from the Zapatistas, how that progressive element has been propelled in Mexican uh, society. I'm going to ask you to make a, a bit of a prediction. Where do you think Mexican politics is going? I do think since AMLO has been very popular, he's, um, his approval ratings when he just joined was like up in the 80s, 80%, which is absolutely insane. Um, it has gone down. Some of his domestic policies I don't agree with. His response to COVID was very not that good. But his he has a strong nationalist and a populist sentiment to his um policies especially towards the united states and other latin american countries he shows a lot of solidarity so i do think people have to do like that especially younger people in mexico um and obviously he can't run again i don't know exactly where it's gonna go i do i do think amlo represented a progressive force that is going to be continuing in mexico um i hope that does continue so if you had to summarize the big takeaway from your capstone what would you say it is i would say that Undocumented migrants in the United States have been portrayed as bad people for a long time, and many Americans are ignorant about why migration happens in the first place. And they're more specifically ignorant about the fact that the United States has, for no centuries, you know, but more recently, has had a massive role in causing that migration. So I think it's, it's stupid to blame people who have no choice but to escape poverty, unemployment, inflation, that was mainly, I'm not saying completely caused, but mainly caused by U.S. policies towards Latin America and Mexico and Central America. Obviously, there's a whole history of like American intervention in Central America in the 70s and 80s that we still see now, you know, Central Americans are the, the highest population coming into the border, even higher than Mexico now, which is really interesting to see. The immigration reform right now is just so broken that even the bare minimum, like the DACA program, isn't even like being allowed. So. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, so I'm going to ask you one question. This is going to move away from like the capstone content okay. itself and just kind of more toward like how you did it. You went through the process of developing a really solid capstone. Uh, what would you tell other students who are just starting theirs? First, find something that you are very interested in. That's the main goal because writing a good capstone about something that you are not even like that interested in is not going to be a good idea. So you're going to struggle with it. It's a lot of reading, a lot of research. Um, but once you, you know, find something that you are really interested in, just, I would start with the research process, obviously. Um, I would find, I, what I like to do, because there are so many sources I had to read, I like to print them out and just like make annotations on them. Try to have a diverse list of sources. Try to look at from, because you have an argument, obviously your capsule is an argument, always try to have the kind of argument, you know, study the kind of argument. In my case, you know, I was studying why people wanted neoliberals in Mexico. What was the argument for that? So yeah, just make sure you have a diverse set of sources. Um, make sure you have your space in your time out, not just procrastinate, because that's really easy with big research papers. Um, start as soon as you can and seek help if you need to, you know, professors or just um, resources on campus that may help you with this. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.